Hey guys, and welcome back to another uh, soldier story. Uh, I, what I will say before we get started is that military stories matter. And the stories that we tell can inspire, uplift, uh, put a smile on someone's face, make them laugh, hopefully uh, provide some education, but as always, uh, provide some entertainment for people because there are those people that are in the military or that have exited the military who, uh, who need it. I'll, I'll leave it at that. So this story is about uh, airborne school. And I'm currently almost 54 years old. And my wife will tell you if I, if I see a movie where someone is on top of a building, kind of looking over, it literally physically makes just my insides tingle. It, it, it doesn't feel good to me. So it's crazy to, to think that I actually went to airborne school and actually thrived uh, in doing so. So here's how airborne school went. This is a long time ago, back in 1990. So how it currently is, I have absolutely no idea. Back in the day, we would do a lot of physical training. We would start uh, a lot of calisthenics and uh, learning how to jump and land in a sawdust pit in Georgia, hot outside. Now you've got sawdust all over you. And so you're jumping off the, the side ledges of this enclosure to hit, shift, and kind of roll. And you just kind of get good at landing with your knees together and your, your ankles together and you're turning away from the fall. And as we progress through the course, we eventually get to what's called the what we call the the hanging uh, hanging suspended agony because you were in this contraption that looked like a parachute and you'd have these two straps over here just like a parachute two straps over here and they would rock you back and forth you'd step off this ledge and the black hat the instructor with a black hat on you would be on a rope with this makeshift sort of looking parachute and you'd be swinging back and forth like this. And as you got closer to the ground, he would just keep lowering the rope so that you're getting closer to the ground. And as the ground is coming up, he'll say land and he will let the rope go, which will let you go on this harness and you would come crashing to the ground. And if you're swinging this way, you know, with a sort of a left slip, turning the parachute this way, you would hit shift and roll. <laughs> and the straps were so tight around your private parts and that as you're swinging back and forth, it was very, very uncomfortable. But it was really important for you to get the straps right because when you were up in a plane, when eventually that chute open, it's, it'll cause a problem. So as we graduated from the, the swinging agony, the suspended harness that we were in, you'd eventually make your way to the big 200 foot towers. And I'm sure they probably have the same towers there in Georgia uh, to this day. And you would be taken up like you're on some sort of Disney ride, click, 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 up, up in the air. And literally you would have a full blown parachute connected to other wires. And so you're up there just kind of dangling. And the, uh, the black hats down below, there was, there was three of them on a bullhorn, they would say, release number two and you'd hear this click if you were number two and you would start floating down and they would tell you to do a left slip you know pull the two uh, i believe they were called risers to the left which would turn the chute a particular way or a right slip and you would begin to work your way down so that you got comfortable with, with what it would look like and feel like when you're actually up in the plane and so then you would come down and land this is the chute and you'd hit shift and roll, release the straps and run off the drop zone. So when it came time to actually jump, uh, there were um, stick leaders and there were chalk leaders. And I was, if, if you're kind of a hula hula guy, I was both the stick leader and the chalk leader uh, bragging on myself a little bit, despite what rank you were. So if I'm the chalk leader when we're up there and uh, a full blown major, is in my chalk, you know, a line of soldiers, you know, Army, Air Force, Marines, who's ever there showing up for the course, that's the person in charge of this particular chalk. And so 
when we shuffled on out, you got your your uh, your uh, reserve shoot in front of you, and you, you in case you're in case the real shoot doesn't open, and everything is really wedged tight. So you're kind of shuffling, and you're kind of in a little bit of pain. It's kind of awkward. You shuffle out to you get on the plane, and eventually you're you're all sitting down. The plane starts, and you're flying there. And uh, the first command, if I remember them correctly, he'll he'll say stand up you know next pass stand up and you know because it's loud and you really can't fully hear so you're looking for hand and arm signals and so next pass stand up and so we would stand the next 10 of us would stand up i believe it was 10 10 maybe 10 to 20 and uh and then he, the instructor would say sound off for equipment check and you would see this this hand this hand and um this motion of your hand you know it's equipment check time so the last person in the back of the line that had stood up, they would look and they would make sure that your, your strap that's, in, that's on your back where your parachute is, is, is connected to this rip cord above your head. So picture this line going straight to the door, 20 soldiers roughly standing up. And if I'm the last person, I'm gonna look. And if we're going out the left door, I'm gonna look to ensure that the, uh, the soldier has the straps, the rip cord in his, in his or her right hand, and that it's connected to their bag and it's connected up here. So if I said that they were okay, that everything was good, they're probably not gonna hear me. So we slap them on the side of their hip and say, okay. And so you hear this, okay, 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 all the way up to the first person. And a couple of times I was the first person in line. And when I get hit, I'll say, all okay, jump master. And then eventually as we're flying along, oh, let me back up. Before then, they'll say, hook up, hook up. That means we just want to make sure everything's hooked up. And I don't, I don't can't remember if we hooked up or they hooked up, but I think we hooked up. That's what it was because we had to hook it up. Yeah, we had the strap in our hand. We hooked it up and that's when it was okay, okay, the whole way up, all okay, jump master. And uh, so after we did the equipment check and the hookup, the black hat is literally leaning out the plane and some of them didn't have, they weren't strapped in anything. They would just have like a, a parachute on their back in case they got sucked out, I guess. And so they're they're hanging out of the plane looking. And when I'm when I'm the first person standing in the door, I remember this warrant officer was looking at me. He had some shades on, he looked pretty cool. And he looked at me smiling, like, you know, as if to say, Are you scared? You know, because <laughs> my foot was right here by the door, and the door is right here to my left, and you hear the wind. <sighs> and so the black hat's looking. And he'll say, he looked at me, he said, one minute. And I go, one minute? And of course, people can't hear me. So the one is signaling to them, we got one minute until we're going. So everybody goes, one minute? And the black hat's back to looking, looking for the drop zone. And he looks back at me and he says, 30 seconds. And I go, 30 seconds? Everybody goes, 30 seconds? And then the light's right here to my left. And it goes from red to green. And then he stands and looks at me, he says, stand in the door. And that's the signal for me to slide the rip cord to him. He takes it and I go one, two, three, and I slap the side of the plane and I jump out, right? So, and you can't see, of course, when you were heading out, there's nothing but air. But as you're falling, you're supposed to count to four. You go, you put your chin in your chest and you go one, 1,000, two, 1,000, three, 1,004. And if your chute's not open, that's a problem because then you need to grab your reserve pack and pull the D-ring, get your head out of the way and start digging this reserve parachute out as fast as you can. Because you're probably, if you when you look above you, initially when you jumped after you count to four, if your parachute's in a cigar shape, you're falling, it's not open. And so you'd have to dig that out. And then you had to get your chin out of the way because if you don't, when the parachute opens like this whoosh, like an airbag, it's the, the D-ring is going to hit you in the face and it's not going to be good, you know, as it comes up. So anyway, but if your parachute opens and you're 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 uh, descending, they tell you to keep your eyes on the horizon. And there's a reason in the military, and you guys watching this video, you know how important it is to follow instructions. And as you're as people are coming down, they're floating, their knees are together their ankles are together and they tell you to keep your eyes on the horizon. You could 
do a few things, maybe a left slip and duck under the wind. If the wind's coming this way, I do a left slip. It takes me under the wind and moves me certain directions. But as you, you can feel the ground coming up, you'll take a couple of peaks. You'll see the buildings, the trees are coming up soon. But now it's time for you to keep your eyes on the rise and looking straight ahead. So if you're floating this way, you're gonna tuck your chin to your chest and you, and you know you're gonna hit shift because you wanna tuck your chin this way to get your head out of the way. Because if you hold your head straight, you're gonna slam it against the ground and it's gonna hurt. But here's what happened to a few folks. It's not funny, but they're coming down. So instead of listening and keeping their eyes on the horizon, they'll open their legs, which makes them look and reach for the ground, especially if they're not looking at the horizon. They're gonna reach for their ground, which, which means they're probably gonna open their legs. And then the, instead of them having their knees bent on their tippy toes, floating down, they'll straighten out their legs and they'll break their leg probably in three pieces. <laughs> it's not funny, but you hear people screaming on the drop zone and you'll say, that person just broke their leg because they weren't listening. So uh, once you hit the ground, hit shift and roll, release the parachute, gather it up, run off the drop zone. You do that five times, they're called five jump chumps. That's what I was, I didn't go to an airborne unit. I just got my wings, they smash them into your chest when it's time for the ceremony. So you get two holes on in your chest and, uh, and then you get your beret and the whole thing is over. So. Fun times, good memories, airborne school, air assault school, ranger school. All you guys that remember those schools. I didn't go to ranger school, but all you guys that remember those schools, uh, you remember a lot of fun. So again, share a story. Let us know uh, about a time in the military and uh, we'll chat with you guys in the discussion box.